So without further delay, give a hand to our brother, pastor, brother Father Flake, give a hand to you all. This experience has not only hurt me, 
but it has devastated children. And let's be clear what this is really about. These inequitable practices are not anything new. Don't let anybody tell you that these practices started post pandemic. These were in place 20 years ago based off inequitable systems that were not addressed. What we're looking at today in society are the results of our black boys and girls who could not read in third grade, who are now 19 and 20 and homeless because we did not serve them equitably. They were disenfranchised, devalued, and disrespected. Then they came after black leaders, black male leaders. The black male leader in Chicago Public Schools has been the mule of the district. We have carried their toughest assignments. And we carry them with pride and dignity. I've been around longer than Brother Muhammad, but he's, he's modeled the same thing at Douglas. He walked into Lynn Long with love, with pride, with empathy for all children. Not just a selective enrollment environment. I knew when he was at CVS fighting for children. So this is nothing new. So the attack that's been placed upon black male leaders in this district for the last 20 to 25 years must stop. So I'm here to support Brother Muhammad. But I'm also here for the give the voice to the voices of black men who come before me who have been ostracized, marginalized, isolated, disrespected, told that you don't know instruction. You're Joe Clark with a bullhorn. You're not intelligent. Just clear the hall. But we found ways to make their data points move. And we provided hope, faith, and love to our children. Yes. Don't let them fool you with data points. Our graduation rate is up, but we're graduating functional illiterates. We're graduating black boys. If you did not choose college, then what? And when you spoke up about it, that's when they ostracized you. That's when they attached you. And I'm one of those. But I am not afraid. Be ye not afraid. So I want to make sure that everybody understands that this is not a one-off situation. Not at all. But as we make sure that we stand up for Brother Muhammad and the others, make sure that we keep our children in the hollow part of our hands. CPAA has embraced this crisis, and I'm going to label it a crisis, a crisis against black male leaders and a crisis against black children, especially our boys, yes. especially our boys. Yes. Mr. LaRavia has made sure that he has stood up, he's taken the bullets, and when he started his journey over 10 years ago, there was a lot of us who did not understand, but he stood up and he's been standing up. So he's put together this piece to make sure they can be elevated. And he's not doing it for himself. He could have easily walked away when they ostracized him and removed him. But he didn't. He's been the catalyst of this fight. He kept the mantra and he kept fighting. We would not be here right now if he had not organized this and said enough is enough. Good evening, beautiful people. I can't stay still. When someone is removed, we've seen principals removed before. 
there's a cloud put over their heads. A lot of other principals don't even want to be associated with them. Sometimes it's because they think maybe they did something. Other times they know they didn't do anything, but I don't want to be associated with them because they might come after me too. And that's perverse logic. But the fact that you not, don't want to be associated with them and you, you're not doing what's necessary to come to their defense is why they're eventually going to get to you too. I originally thought of this as coming to the defense of Brother Muhammad, but we have to do it a little differently. What's the best defense? A good offense. And so not only do we have to come to the defense of Brother Muhammad, we have to go on the offense and make sure that not only is he returned, but that the people who did this to him are terminated and never work in Chicago public schools ever again. I'm not playing. These are the people we have to go on the offensive against. We have to go on the offensive against Network Chief Devin LaRosa. We have to go on the offensive against Kishasha Williams Ford. We have to go on the offensive against the Law Department's investigator, Kelly Tarrant. We have to go on the offensive against her supervisors in the Law Department. We have to go on the offensive against that staff, that faction, that CTU faction at Lindblom that came after our brother. We have to build our case. I respect people's intelligence. There are people who will marshal you to do stuff, like those folks marshal those uh, alumni to come after him, didn't give them all the information, and they just like sheep. I'm not going to treat you like sheep. I'm going to present the case to you. And you can decide for yourself. Now, I don't do reading slides a lot, but this is a summary slide. This is a summation of what happened. Kinshasa Williams Ford in the Office of Local School Council Relations, Devin LaRosa, Chief of Network 16, and a faction of Limbaugh teachers pressured members of the Local School Council's Principal Selection Committee not to choose Muhammad. When that ultimately failed, because the local school council knew brilliance when they saw it, when that, that ultimately failed, they engaged in a series of appalling actions to create as many public failures as possible for Muhammad, which meant knowingly and intentionally failing limb and its students in the process of manufacturing these failures. The evidence suggests that in response to the smear campaign launched by La Rosa and disgruntled limb staff members, CPS official Kelly Tarrant weaponized the CPS Law Department to launch an unethical, one-sided investigation aimed at prejudicing Mr. Muhammad and convicting him without any credible evidence and she had the full support of every one of her supervisors when she did. Muhammad was targeted and victimized by internal corruption, religious bigotry, and deep conflicts of interest. And this case is part of a larger, troubling phenomenon of CPS officials railroading principles. Now that's a heck of a statement. Can you prove that, Mr. LaRocca? You let me know if I proved it when we're done. Now, I'm a Limboon parent. So before I do the prosecution, I want to do a little defense. I'm a Limboon parent. My son, my son's the most beautiful person on earth. And he's at Limboon. Now, I'm in Limboon. This is his first year before Muhammad. And I get this email from the head of the local school council. Imagine you're a parent and you get this email. I'm writing this email with absolute concern and frustration with what's going on with some of our liberal students. I was made aware on Monday of a fight that occurred in the hallway between a few students. In addition to these students' fightings, there was another fight that was interrupted by our security staff today. A fight that took place Monday between two other students and one on Friday. There was yet another fight that took place in the spring, port, uh, spring sports pep rally. This display of aggression and violence has never been a part of our liberal tradition in my five years here at Lindbloom. And she goes on and on. What do you think? I'm looking at Margaret, my son's mom and my lifetime partner, known her since I was seven years old. I'm looking at Margaret, where did we got our child into? And then Muhammad came. I drop my son off, I see him in front. 
every single morning, greeting students. He's got security posted. He's directing them. They got stations. I'm like, oh. All right, it's a new day in the blue. I'm feeling better. I come pick him up at the end of the day. He's out again. Not only is he out in front of the school, he's walking them down the 63rd. He's got security with him. He's like a one-man safe passage. I'm feeling good. My boy's in safe hands. Everything's changed. The fight's drastically reduced. There's order. He beat out 11 candidates in the principal selection process. He, there's a thing in CPS called principal eligibility where a state license is not enough. You have to get another license from CPS and they put you this whole thing. When people fail, you know one of the people that they send the people who fail to? To pass it, you know who, who they send them to? That's right. <laughs> That's who they send them to. And everyone he's taught and tutored has passed it on the first try. He first came, when he first came in, he asked for an audit. I want to look at the financials. All right, I'm like, okay, he knows what he's doing. Oh, and he engaged a parent and community like no one, else, no one before him. I'll let him speak on that too. I don't know, if, I, I don't know who's better at defending him, me or him. <laughs> he's really good, and so he's going to join me in some of this because I think you should hear from him. So let's go back to the beginning before he was hired. Next slide. This is a Facebook chat. And it's exemplary of quite a few emails that went around when they were thinking about hiring our brother. The informant, that's some interesting language. <laughs> the informant also said, if you don't look or act like him, him being our brother, he will give them a hard time. They did not elaborate, but I took it as if you white or gay, watch out. No one want to go through this process again. Keep in mind, he belonged to the Church Nation of Islam. I really hope everyone, everyone is wrong. Happy Father Day. What's his religion got to do with it? Whoever he's talking to is asking the right question. He says, look at Nation of Islam. They hate the Jews, whites, and gays. Sick. This man is in the front office of Limbloom as the clerk. And he's not the only one in that school with this kind of attitude, spreading this kind of filth. This is the head of local school council relations. Her job is to help the LSCs navigate the principal selection process. She's supposed to stay neutral. But she had a friend who wanted to be the principal. Her friend could not pass the principal's exam. And so she begins to advocate. This is what she said. One, she should have recused herself because she was on somebody's side. That's right. Not only did she fail to recuse herself, but she became an obstacle to the local school council. Lindblom is an ALSC. They don't have full LSC powers. Why, I don't know. That's usually reserved for probationary schools. It's not a probationary school. But it gives CPS more power over their decision making. <clears throat> she would not help them through the process of becoming a full AL LSE, number one. Two, Sister Lynn White is the community rep and a thorn in Ms. Ford's side. Ms. White, during the LSC election, she's the community rep, her name was on the ballot every election. Somehow, in one election, they pulled the ballots, put some different ballots in, and guess whose name was off the ballot? Ms. White. I said, how is it that my name has been removed? He said, I don't know, but it certainly has been removed. I then called downtown and he told me, you need to speak with Kinshasa Ford. So I called. When I first got Ms. Ford on the fly, she was very professional, very polite, until she found out that I was calling from Limbloom, I was a community rep, and I wanted to know why was my name removed from the ballot. She had gotten a Dr. Rice, I don't know who he is, he's a consultant of some type, mm -hmm. and she couldn't answer any of my questions, and he said, well, your name should have never been on the ballot. I said, who are you and based upon what? I said, I think you need to understand that I've been a community rep 
for a number of years at this school. My name has always been on the ballot. I've been a community rep at another local school, at another LSC. My name was always on the ballot. So help me understand why all of a sudden today, my name has been removed from the ballot. They went back and forth and back and forth, could never answer the question. She called the assistant principal as, during the principal selection process, advocating for her saying, she's my very good friend and classmate. She actively and vocally opposed hiring Muhammad by saying things like, giving an interim contract and not a full contract, because she wants her friend to come in. She says, to go with Mr. Muhammad, you're just settling for anybody. I won't allow just anyone. I won't allow. Who is she to think she can allow anything? I won't allow. I just won't allow just anyone to be the principal of Lindblom. And then last but not least, I'm not going to let my school just burn. This is eyewitness testimony from local school council members. This is how she behaved. She needs to go. Next, Devin LaRosa. Now, LaRosa Ford is only in the picture during the local school council selection process. Ford is, uh, uh, LaRosa is in the picture before and after. This is what he did before. He walks in and he just says off the bat, he says uh, to the local school council, you don't need Karen, the AP. Which is interesting because he just came from Wisconsin. <clears throat> he doesn't know Karen. He doesn't know anything about CPS. So what does that tell you? Somebody sent him. That's right. Somebody That's right. above him sent him. He demanded when, when the brother ended up being the last candidate, he says, I want more candidates, additional candidates. Well, he just beat 11. There are none left. He says, you can't go forward with a form for just one candidate. He said this to the local school council. When they voted to give the brother a four-year contract, he gave him an interim contract instead. Now, this is after brother was selected. <clears throat> He sent these undermining letters. So they had the big protest, the stage protest, and tried to use that to create some doubt about who this brother was. So he then sent these letters to the community to undermine Abdul and create doubt and suspicion that cloud over his head. Then he told Muhammad, you can't send any letters to your parents without them coming through me. So, now listen, he let the AP send a letter to the parents to rile them up. And now that Muhammad is there, he won't let him communicate with parents without being censored by La Rosa. When the counselor said, protested, he said, well, yeah, I, I need to send messages all the time. And I got to go through, you say, no, you can send messages, he can't. So his subordinates can communicate with parents, but he can't. This is La Rosa. This is, and then on top of that, La Rosa and Felicia Sanders, his boss, sent out this letter. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, I'll just read part of it. I'm reaching out to give you an update on the school's leadership. Today at our monthly meeting of the Board of Education, the Chief Executive Office of CPS asked the board to postpone taking action on recommendation to give a four-year principal's contract to Mr. Abdul Muhammad. Importantly, the CEO did not withdraw his recommendation in hopes to be able to ask the board to act on that recommendation at a future date. Until then, Mr. Muhammad will continue to lead the school as interim principal. The CEO has chosen to take this course um, because of recent information regarding Mr. Muhammad's transition. If that is not under. Now he's sending this to the parents and the teachers. And the students. And the students. This has raised concerns. His, he's just there, and this is how they introduce him to the community. Starting to create the cloud. This is another one they sent in December when they postponed this contract again. I'm not going to read it. Same kind of misinformation. Planting seeds of doubt. Something's wrong with this man. We got to watch him. Yeah. He gave him a list of things to do to get a contract. Every principal gets a contract, they just get a contract. So he did everything on the list, still no contract. The list was just to buy time. Mm -hmm. One, give him more stuff to do than he needs to so he'll slip up on something he's supposed to be doing. And then to buy time to create this case. Next slide. He aligned himself with opposition groups. He actively sought out people with complaints. When I was principal at Blaine, I told my parents, you got a complaint against the teacher, you better talk to the teacher. Don't bring it to me. Now, if you talk to the teacher and you can't get it, then you can bring it to me. 
But the most important relationship is not your relationship with me. Your most important relationship as a parent is your relationship with your child's teacher, not your child's principal. So whatever this problem is, go and build that relationship by working it out. That's leadership. That's supervision. Not Mr. LaRosa. He created a pipeline of people to come surpass Muhammad and go straight to him. He should be fired for that by itself. It's derelict in his supervision. By itself. He sat in local school council meetings listening to things he knew were lies because Mr. Muhammad was, yeah, they were saying like he's not doing anything about special ed. Mr. Muhammad has loads of emails. The brother documents everything so well too, by the way. He has loads of emails showing he's talking to this chief about his efforts to solve this problem. And at the local school council meeting, they're saying he's not doing anything. And the chief who knows this is a lie is just sitting there. And again, he was too new. This had to be coming from somewhere else. Now let's look at the staff. Christina Davis is the athletic director, and she is the woman that Brother Omari was telling you about that he met with, and who was saying that uh, she was the ringleader, who wanted him, who was upset with him for following policy. Yeah, well, speaking of Christina Davis, like I mentioned, my son plays basketball, and after the season was over, some of the parents wanted to put on a banquet to celebrate the basketball players for having such a successful season. And the woman who was leading this, coordinating this effort, uh, she comes to me and she says, well, you know, I'm, I'm attempting to put this banquet on and I'm attempting to work with Ms. Davis, but I'm not sure why I'm getting all of the pushback and the resistance I am to wanting to have it where I want to have it and having the parents be involved. And she told me that we couldn't raise money from the parents. I was like, well, none of that sounds right. So I ended up going to Principal Muhammad asking him, were any of these things that she was saying true or accurate about we couldn't raise money for the event, we couldn't have it off-site. And he says, well, no, that's not true at all. And, and this, this dovetails back into something that she said uh, during our meeting. And it was something to the effect of that it's very hard to even do the things that we would have been doing before because we don't want this principal to have uh, anything that he can point to and say, I did that. Like, oh, it seems to me she's, she's trying to intentionally squelch any possibility of, of a win. Like the, the basketball team had a winning season, kicked absolute butt, and this mom wanted to have a completely parent-funded event. And she said she did everything she could to resist the thing. I send Ms. Davis a text message saying, hey, can we talk uh, about this banquet and, and, and some of the things that I think could be helpful in terms of making it happen? And so she tells me she couldn't talk because she was out sick, never calls me back, but then the other mom tells me, tells me that she sends her a text message to say, hey, why does Mr. Kamal want to talk to me? We don't have any business together. I'm interacting with you, I'm doing this with you, I don't need to talk to him. And whatever her thoughts are for me and my, my support of the principal will mean that she will actively tear apart uh, the possibility of honoring uh, the basketball players for the sake of her own agenda for having this principal be uh, not credited for the support that he's given. When you, when you look at that in totality and you have someone who's so set on her own agenda or his own agenda to oust a principal such that you would rail against an event that's designed to honor our athletes, our student athletes, without any awareness or wherewithal or care or concern for that the ones who really suffer are the boys, are the, the, the students. And you really think that by virtue of trying to further your own personal agenda that you're not hurting them, that you're not damaging them, uh, is just beyond anything that I can, I can comprehend. And it's, it's, it, I just shudder to think that, that, that this is somebody who has a real responsibility and real uh, um, uh, accountability towards our students and just, I mean, is beyond not honoring it, not fulfilling on it, that it's damaging to the boys. So she mismanaged money from school fundraisers, failed to issue and retain receipts, on several occasions did not turn in money from Lynn Bloom's sporting events, put money from school fundraisers in her own personal bank account. When he found out and asked her to, I'm sorry, you know, you have to give that back. 
she argues that it's hers because she brought her own money to bring change. And he's trying to explain to her, well, even if you brought your own bank, if you sold a ticket for $5, <laughs> that should be $5. You know, if I was a 10-year-old child, as I said in the video, and I was selling tickets, and I brought $200, and then I ended up with $914, how much is a, hold up, stop, stop, stop. All right, who's a kid in here that's halfway decent in math? I want a, I want a child. You hear from, okay. You go to, you're selling, you bring $200 of your own money. And then you're selling tickets and you're giving change with your own money. At the end of the day, you don't have $200 anymore. You have $914. How much money goes back to the school? He said $714. But Christina Davis acted like she couldn't figure that out. <laughs> and she did it in writing. She did it in writing. Not only was she poor with money, she endangered students and acted with reckless disregard for their safety. She authorized cheerleaders to practice at an off-site facility. She failed to accompany students to the facility. That gets you fired again right there. She did not inform the principal, fired right there. She lied to officials in CPS Sports Administration and I talked directly to the, and I gotta say this, I don't run my union like some folks run unions. A worker come to them and complain, it's like they don't even investigate, they don't even vet it. You know, the principals, you know, a teacher's union, for example, you know, and I fully support the teachers being a powerful union, but they have some vetting problems sometimes. You know, a teacher comes complaining about somebody, it's like, let's go get them. People come to me, I say, okay, what happened? Okay. Do you have witnesses? you have some evidence? Right. Because I'm not going to put my reputation and my organization's reputation on the line defending incompetence. Right. So, so I interviewed the official in CPS Sports Administration. When he said that so-and-so knows about it, I called her up. And she said, yeah, she lied and said he knew. But then when he was in the room with her, he said, oh no, he did not know. <laughs> I didn't tell him. So I'm an um, athletic program administrator. So I'm over girls and boys volleyball, girls basketball. And then I also um, oversee Gately Stadium. Um, I had received a phone call from two parents and they stated that um, their daughters have got hurt doing practice, doing limb bloom practice. So I called Christina Davis, which is the um, athletic director. I did talk to Ms. Davis and I told Ms. Davis what was going on. And I said, you know, you probably need to reach out to Presbo Muhammad. And she was like, oh, he knows what's going on with this. I said, okay. But then I guess after, you know, some back and forth was going on, um, we reached out and had a conference call with Principal Muhammad, Christina Davis, and Christina said in that meeting, um, when we was talking about it, telling her all the you know, accusations that the parents made and what was going on. And I also told her that, that the parents have shared that they was paying $10 for their kids to practice at this facility. And she was like, no, nah, that's for tumbling and some other stuff. I was like, oh, okay. But in that meeting, she said Principal Muhammad didn't know anything. And so I didn't say that. And I'm just looking. I'm like, and this was on a conference call. I said, no, that's not what she was telling me earlier. You know, she, when we spoke, she said that he knew. But once he got on the phone call with all of us on there, Ms. Davis said he didn't know anything about it. And she said mm, that on two occasions. What reason would she have to be this honest? Sometimes they probably think we're not going to call the principal and she's just trying to, maybe she was trying to get ahead of it. I really don't know. Is she supposed to tell the principal? And maybe she was telling you what she knew she should have done? Is well, that something they're supposed his, to know? I said, are they supposed to call tell the principal about these kind of things? You know what? You should tell your principal if you have teams practicing off-site just in case something happens, so they will be aware of it. 
Now you should. You know, lying to investigators. Fired. Several students were injured at the facility. Next. Davis failed to document student injuries. All of this, if you're a principal, you're out. Best be a black principal. A white teacher? I don't know. You got a chance. She brought her own child to school, from what I understand. Said so she couldn't get childcare. She makes $88,000 a year, $30,000 of benefits. I don't know how much in overtime, and she can't get childcare. Brother Muhammad, talk to CPS. You can't do that. It's a liability. You have to follow proper procedures. That's all. He's putting instructions for people to not get fired, and they're getting mad at him for it. 37 of her coaches, she's the athletic director. Did I mention that? She's the athletic director, and 37 of her coaches were out of compliance. She failed student athletes to hurt the principal. She actually refused to do a banquet. A parent funded, parents wanted to organize a banquet for the basketball team because they had a better than expected season, and she kept resisting it. And she confided in a couple of parents that she's like, we can't do the things we normally do because, you know, it'll look like a win for him. She failed the students intentionally, denied them a celebration for a fantastic season because she didn't want Brother Muhammad to look good. So what's the word, wicked? wicked I'm gonna use that one later. She made false or misleading statements to CPS investigators next. And Kelly Tarrant, the law department. So we've got Kishasha, we've got La Rosa, we've covered the teachers. Kelly Tarrant of the law department decided she was going to take up her case against her principal. Let's look at Kelly. So this is Kelly Tarrant. She's an investigator with CPS. She conducted a flawed, one-sided fishing, fishing expedition against Mr. Muhammad. Next. She failed to vet witnesses. She failed to interview, and I believe it's up to, what is it, 40, 28? 28 people who could have countered what those teachers said. She failed to look at scores of documents that would have shown what those teachers said was a lie. And the only reason we know this, by the way, because they didn't give him his charges either, but they made a mistake. Normally when they let go of a principal, and y'all gotta listen to me because these are some devious people, listen to this. Normally when they let, remember when Brother Merle said, he still doesn't know what he's charged with yet? He still doesn't know, he's been removed since December. They'll say he's been removed pending the results of an investigation. Now, you all have, I know you guys have seen the news and it's like, well, we can't comment because it's an ongoing investigation. So CPS uses that as an excuse to remove a principal while they're still investigating so they don't have to tell him or you what he's charged with because there is no substantive charge out there. And sometimes they'll remove you with an ongoing investigation trying to look for more stuff or something to pin on you. But when they removed him, they said he was removed because of substantiated charges. And so we had our lawyers remind them of that and that they couldn't use that as an excuse. And that's how we got the charges released. And we have documented 82 lies, provable lies, that all the law department had to do was look at a document. Talk to a witness. Use their brain. They didn't do either one of those things. Failed to give Muhammad a chance to respond to allegations. There's certain due process things, right? If, you, you're, you're, if you're on trial, you get to know what you're charged with. You get to face the people who are making the allegations against you and respond and they give you time to gather evidence. He got none of that. Kelly Turan in the law department didn't give it to him. They didn't give it to Gerald. They didn't even give it to Jamaica. They didn't even give it to me. Failed to provide charges after removal until threat of litigation. Next. These are one of, this is, exam, this is something straight out of their investigative report. Evidence does exist to support the finding that interim principal Abdul Muhammad of Limbo Math and Science Academy was aware of critical inaccuracies in the IEP and 504 procedures and record keeping. 
Despite being aware, accuracy, inaccuracy still occur. This is actually something that made its way to the law department, an inaccuracy in an IEP. Teacher O'Hara, one of the Lim Bloom Seven, <laughs> has sent a February 2023 email demonstrating that he was not invited to his students' 504 meeting. This made his way to the law department. First of all, he didn't, they, he, he didn't have a counselor in place. And so some inaccuracies were occurring. He was, and there's emails showing that he was working with the network chief to get a counselor. The counselors are the, the case manager, excuse me. They're the ones who do the whole, he doesn't invite people to IEP meetings, the case manager does. And he's working to get one in place. And while he's trying to get one in place, some inaccuracies are occurring. Like, trivial. I mean, trivial. And they've elevated this to the law department. He actually fixed that problem, then another problem happened. He fixed that, and they acknowledge he fixed it, but then they say, well, there's no long-term plan. The long-term plan is to get a good case manager. That's what he did. It's not as spicy as you thought it would be, is it? Right? This is what we're talking about. Someone not invited to a meeting. Next. In regards to breaches of Illinois special education laws, evidence does exist to support the allegation that Interim Principal Abdul Muhammad of Limblum Math and Science Academy was aware, and let me talk about this was aware. Being aware of something could get you into trouble. Because if you're aware and you don't do anything, and then the problem continues, then you can get in a little trouble. But they skip that middle logic. They'll say he was aware and the problem continued, hoping that you read it and fill in the blank that he didn't do anything about it when there is documented evidence that he jumped through hoops, leaped over buildings, everything he possibly could to fix these problems. They don't acknowledge that in this report. This is a crazy one. Provided inconsistent information to Chief Devin LaRosa regarding a claim that you accompanied the student to a nearby sit-go station to purchase snacks after school. <laughs> this made its way to the law department. Now, a student's in sit-go. Her mother's looking on the GPS. Like, what you doing in sit-go? She calls her. What you doing in sit-go? And she goes, she pants and goes, I'm with the principal. <laughs> Principal's nowhere around. Um, on page 13, CPS Law Department investigative report, it reads, a parent informed Chief LaRosa on November 18th that their daughter had left the Limbloom campus to purchase snacks at a nearby sit-go. It says the student left. Not left with the principal. The student, it's in their own report, they acknowledge that the student went by themselves. But then they go back, well, your statement was inconsistent. Without pointing out what was inconsistent about it. Next, the parent calls La Rosa. And as Abdul is going back and forth with La Rosa in those emails you just saw on the exact date of December 18th, Abdul invites him to the meeting, to, a, to the school, to, have a, to be a part of this uh, conversation with the alderman, Stephanie Coleman. Instead of talking to him while he's there on the same date, you can read the CPS Law Department report, this same day, he is submitting this ridiculous sit-go gas station allegation to the law department. Is that right? Supervision. Basic supervision. Failed to vet witnesses. Failed to provide a complaint or notice of allegations. Failed to fact check complaints. Next. Failed to interview at least 28 credible objective witnesses. Failed to give Muhammad a chance to respond. Failed to provide charges until after the removal and a threat of litigation and relied on the testimony of compromised witnesses. Fees. Now, we're going to go back. Next. All right, why is this picture of this white woman on the screen? So, I am about to talk about systemic racism. I am about to talk about white privilege, white racism, institutionalized racism. And when you talk about white privilege, sometimes people look at you and they get a look. What, does he, does he, wait, but does he not like white people? That's my mother. That's my mother. The white woman right there. That's my mother. 
woman I love more than any other woman on earth. God rest her soul. So, as I start getting into this, I might get a little heated. I'm not mad at white people. I'm mad at white racism. I'm mad at white privilege. And the pro I actually think we need to stop using the term white privilege because it is hiding the other side of white privilege. The other side of white privilege is black disadvantage. That's the problem with white privilege. There's a comedian. His name is Greer Barnes. I don't know if you've ever seen him. He kind of looks a little like uh, Idris Elba, but not quite as handsome and a little more scruffy. <laughs> he has this routine, it's hilarious. He's talking about walking down the street and how he's scared of white women. Um, I don't like walking up behind white women at night. <laughs> Makes me really uncomfortable. <laughs> so I cross the street. And there's a lot of white people in the audience in his uh, set, and he says, you know, white women, y'all should rob black men. If I was a white woman, I would rob black dudes. <laughs> I'd walk up to black guys and be like, hi, my name is Sarah, give me your wallet. Sarah, that's my grandmama name. Give me your wallet or I'm gonna scream. But here, here, Sarah. You don't need to get the cops involved. Take it. <laughs> Look at some of the white women like, wow, we could actually do that. And he says, you know, some of y'all, he looked at some of the white women, he said, some of y'all thinking, I could really do that, <laughs> right? I could really, I could, I might be able to get away with that. And that's exactly what happened in them. Christina Davis, he walks in, he's walking down the street like Greer, and he runs into Christina Davis, and she tries to stick him up, but she tries to stick up his integrity. Let me continue to do fundraising the way I normally do it. Let us do hiring the way we normally do it. And if you don't, I'm going to yell and scream. <laughs> Brother Abdul said, I got to do my job. And so she screamed. And the CPS police came. Sirens blazing. Here come Devin LaRosa. Sirens blazing. Here comes Kelly Terrence, sirens blazing. Here comes Felicia Sanders, Bogdana Skumbova, Libby Massey, Assistant General Counsel, Joe Moriarty, General Counsel. They coming, sirens blazing. What seems to be the problem? He won't invite me to an IEP meeting. And the CPS police organized an entire team of people to treat that white woman's complaint. This woman, like, what was her currency? What, was she ethical? The woman who wouldn't do an event for black boys to celebrate them because she wanted to, didn't want the principal to have a success. Was her currency her ethics? No. Was her currency her honesty and integrity? No. What was it about her that made this institution circle itself around her and all of her needs and aim themselves directly at this black man. What was it about her? We all know what it was. Systemic racism means there's a system, and they organized a system. The law department, the Office of Network Supports, organized a whole system around her to target this brother who was the only one in the whole situation that had any integrity. Institutional racism. What is this system a part of? The institution of CPS. The institution is licensing this system to go after this man and other black people like him. If you look at that and you still don't understand or agree that white privilege
and black disadvantage, systemic racism, institutionalized racism exists, then you don't want to know. This is hard for me. I risked my job for CTU repeatedly when they were right. Because I understood that our greatest enemy is the wealth, the corporate wealth that runs CPS. And CTU stood against that corporate wealth and was the most powerful force we had against that corporate wealth. But CTU got some problems. And so I'm about to state this as a friend. Sometimes your friend got to tell you what's wrong with you because nobody else will. These are two CTU staffers. They're outside of a school. Their teacher, a teacher who's cool with the CTU staffers was complaining about her principal. And they were outside the school with a petition to get rid of the principal. Then the teachers from the school go out and they go, why are you guys, what are you guys doing? There's one staff person and he told, he, gave, he basically gave the staff person an assignment she didn't want, like a classroom she didn't want. And so she, being cool with CTU people, went into the central mechanisms of CTU and got them to put paid staff in front of his school to petition against him. Okay. This is a petition of no confidence for our person. These are just the concerns that have been put together. So if this is something that... Who put together those concerns? So there, I said there were um, parents. She's not at liberty to say. She's at liberty to stand out here and represent these random people, but we have no right to know who these people are. So How does that make any sense? You will be informed. But as so as a member of the community, we should be informed now, right? As, so when the, the, everything's put together, you'll be informed. Why are we not informed ahead of time? That's I'm, the point. That's my concern here. That's what I was telling her. So what is I the secretiveness the and all is, this randomness that's coming? You know what I mean? We're not all aware of this going on. Yeah, I wasn't aware. Right. That's why I'm upset, Ms. Weber. Security, because make I sure you're doing rounds from the building. And I feel disrespected. Make sure because I feel like they're out here representing me too. Not, and I'm not that person. Uh, Do you see what I mean? Not be that's, in the it's the lack of Unless clarity that bothers office. me. The lack of transparency that bothers me. Uh, because like you're saying, we are representing Amy's so They're the here now trying to represent us negatively, apparently, in a way. Nah, no, you don't belong to our parents. school, so how does that make any sense for I'm you to represent us? As a member of community, I am concerned. Well, and what do you know about our school? How many LSC meetings have you attended? I have not attended. And so how do you know about our school? How many teachers out of the 60 have, teachers have you spoken you know what? to? I, I don't appreciate the, the grilling. I just said if you're not comfortable signing, you don't have to sign. But there have been people that have come to me. And I said, you know what, I want to help because that sounds like it's a, it's a concern. And so, who are you and you're representing I'm, I'm our, our community member. member? Yeah. So you live in the community? Yeah. And, I'm interested in finding out information. If I have a right to know what's going on. And you clearly don't want to share all the information with me. That's the part that has me upset. I don't have permission from that hasn't been discussed, so I'm not comfortable Which is why I don't people. feel comfortable with you come standing out here without all of us knowing what's going on. Because there's more than whatever you say you're representing. There's a lot of teachers in the school that don't have any idea about this. I'm telling you right now to at least share that fact that you're going to be out here with teachers so that teachers know ahead of time. Some so kind I'm of a flyer or some kind of a thing that going on. No, not talking to me now. Talking to but us as a collective group. It's the secretiveness that I can't stand. It's disrespectful and it's un unprofessional. And it makes us look bad. And, and we're working hard right. to make this school a better place. And I feel personally and I, offended. It is. It's about all of us because all of us are a team. And we're all trying to build family here. And this is not building family. Correct. I'm so sorry you feel that way. And that feels blatantly disrespectful for, towards all of those Especially of us who work that Especially because you don't know hard. our school. Because you don't know our school. Exactly. Yeah. It's insulting. What's because you don't you know, have the, the full picture. Ads? They don't vet their people. The next slide you're going to see is a message from Jesse Sharkey. When I was, uh, I don't know, a few years back, I got an email from a principal with a text chain of CTU staffers talking about what they're going to do to principals. They were basically proposing a principal's data, a database of principals who shouldn't be hired. Right? A database of principals, and, and since there's two CTU reps on every local school council, they were going to pass this beta database around to every local school council to keep anybody off that list, on that list for getting a job. 
Well, I snapped, sent a message to Jesse Sharkey, who was president at the time, and to his credit, this is how he responded. Greetings, President LaRavier. Thank you for writing to me. I always prefer to communicate openly about potential conflicts than to make assumptions and build up resentment. I, too, had noticed the thread with which you are referring. Please understand that it took place on a listserv which is unmoderated, where CTU members and others post ideas, articles, frustrations, and everything in between. Postings on this list do not represent official CTU positions. The CTU has a formal leadership structure, elected officers, an elected executive board, a house of delegates, and we formulate our policy positions through these bodies. And this is what he tells them. He's telling me he told his people this, to his credit. He tells them, right now there's a lot of justified hostility towards lists of bad people type databases. Think do not hire lists, the gang database, etc. A lot of people on our side are justifiably upset about the boss keeping these kinds of lists. Our arguments against their lists go along the following lines. There's no process for who goes on the list. The information is used to deny people work. There's no way for people to get off the list. Right? That's, the CTU was out there protesting the gang database, and then they come up with an idea to create a gang database for principles. That means you have no ethical center. You just say whatever you want to justify whatever position. You don't have a center of values to guide you. And he's acting like a parent talking to his children, reminding them of their values. I told him he needs to fire those people. He didn't. And I knew that if those people that came up with that idea stayed in those leadership positions, they were going to produce other ideas and other actions just as sick as this one. Yes, sir. And that's what happened to our brother. Now, again, I collect data. So I sent an email to every one of those teachers telling them what they were charged with. So this is one I sent to Ms. Davis. Hello, Ms. Davis. I'm writing on behalf of the Truth and Justice for Limbloom Commission. For the past month, we've investigated the removal of the Limbloom principal, Abdul Muhammad. A, deep, a deeply disturbing picture has emerged based on documents and interviews with witnesses. A summary of the picture painted by the evidence is as follows. And I tell them what they're charged with. Ms. Davis, you've been accused of engaging in specific acts of misconduct as part of this alleged conspiracy. As we continue to investigate, we're extending you an opportunity to defend yourself and communicate your perspective. Please let us know what time and date you are available for an investigative interview. The interview will be in person and it will be recorded. If you need a virtual option, please let us know. Right. To be clear, we are a private group and you have no legal and we have no, you have no legal obligation to appear before us. Just as your normal obligations during an employer-led investigation do not apply, the normal employer legal contractual obligations and duties do not apply to us, such as recognizing the right to counsel. Legal obligations aside, we are fair and reasonable people, so if you'd like to bring counsel with you, we encourage you to do so. And we will accommodate that request. I said that to her, every one of those teachers, Devin LaRosa, Kishasha Williams Ford, You think I heard back from any of them? But I did my due diligence. Before we get to demands, I'd like to give uh, Brother Muhammad, if you have anything that you want to add, <laughs> uh, a chance to speak. So, um, so 
I thank Troy for coming with this information just to prove to you how trivial and trifling these people who brought these false charges to remove a black principal in a black school majority with a black LSC in a black neighborhood. And y'all in Chicago, and you know, where's Brother Amy? My brother is here. He know we can't go to Pepsi. This is my uh, Latino brother. But Brother Abel knows that three, teach three black teachers can't go to Pilsen and get together and protest the Latino principal and then the Latino parents agree with them. Right. They would drive them out of the school right. and say, what is wrong with you? Right. If you went to uh, the North Side in the white school with a white leader that they selected for their children, and two or three black teachers that were disgruntled against the white principal in the white school in the white neighborhood with the white LSC, they would not listen to them. You can't do that anywhere except in our community. So the question you need to ask is do black people have the right to self-determination? Do we have the right to choose our leaders without the that we need to answer. So, brothers and sisters, I just want to share with you all, because he came with a lot, I'm just going to do this real quick. Some of the things just that were in this report, right? There's, you know, y'all know what microaggressions are? Yes, sir. So if you ever, my mother uh, and my father, both were like um, some of the first people in corporate America. My mother suffered a great deal in corporate America because she integrated corporate America, and my father did as well. And y'all know black parents don't come home and tell their children about their experiences. It comes out in a book, but when it comes out, they don't, they don't come home to the minute folks crazy at them. No, they don't do that. It comes out in other ways. But what our people experience when they go in these environments is called microaggressions. So you get all of these comments about, like I got when I came to Limbo, I mean, how can you, you never worked in a selective enrollment school before. You were at Douglas. But now, it's only 11 selected enrollment schools out of the 94 schools, high schools in Chicago. So what does that mean? The vast majority of principals and assistant principals do not have selected enrollment experience. So why is that the yardstick when it's not the yardstick for somebody that's white? So what microaggressions do is like they uh, nitpick at any little thing. Right? Let me give you some examples, and I'm not making this up. My brother Troy can bear witness that I'm not making this up. So one of the things that they brought to the law department that is actually in the report, uh, one of the things they said, well, this was the problem, like he talked about special ed. And then it actually says in the report that the problem was solved. But then you saw they still came with the charge, even though it says in their report that, that we solved the problem. Another teacher said, Principal Muhammad bought himself, this is not, I'm not making this up. Principal Muhammad bought himself a Mac computer and two printers. I'm not making this up. Now, I'm the principal of the high school. I got there, uh, now let me give you her full statement. He bought himself a Mac computer and two printers before he bought supplies for the counseling department. Now, even if I did, I'm the principal. I'm the boss, right? But that's not what happened, what actually happened is that I got there on July 7th. I didn't order my computer until November 9th. July, August, September, October, November. Five months as the principal. Mr. Booker's here. Five months, that's the operations manager. Five months as the principal with no print, no computer and no printer. Why? Because I wanted to make sure all the teachers had everything that they needed. So do you think the law department vetted what these teachers said? These are the complaints. He bought a print, a computer, and a printer. Then another teacher, uh, Mr. Brannigan, uh, on December 22nd, that's the first snowfall in Chicago, so a lot of people missed school that day. A lot of teachers were out. So the lie that they said to the law department is, this is Mr. Brannigan, Mr. Muhammad came in after 8 o'clock and didn't do anything to help cover the classes in the school. Now, if you know me, that doesn't sound like me. You don't even sound nothing like me. But now, 
So what I did, I looked at the time that the time that I swiped in on December 22nd. And I looked at the design that Mr. Brandon had swiped in on December 22nd. Oh, oh, oh. The law department could have did that, but they didn't. But I swiped in at 746. He swiped in at 747. But he told the law department that I got there after 8 o'clock and didn't do anything to help. And they actually took what these people said, all of these false statements, and took them and wove them into a case against somebody who from the day I got to them room, and I have witnesses, I've been putting in work. They make false statements like I mismanaged money. Listen, I'm not, I'm not making this up. They said, listen, the clerk, her name is Miss McDaniel. He made some strange purchases for the pet rally. Balloons, a DJ, and a 360 hoop. I'm not making this up. schools, but you have to know there are people in the schools 
that are doing the work that you as black parents in the black community want done in the schools. So that's the work that I've been doing for the last 25 years. That's the work that I did at Little everywhere else that I've gone. And I'll say this and then I'm done and we'll go to the last part of it. Um, I gotta give y'all my resume, some of y'all know it. I started on the west side at Weston House. And some of y'all know Lizzie Grill, and that's who I'm really, really real. I'm real. I'm as real as they come. I started on the west side at Weston House when it was a neighborhood school. When they were winning uh, championships, the students on the west side loved me to death. To this very day. Yes, you have no love. I'm just being real. 
You would think that they would be like, man, look at this work that this man is doing. Absolutely not. They don't know the uh, Everybody on the Cook County side, the judges, the lawyers, the security guards, the superintendent, that all of them, if you go down there today, seven years after I left, they still have love for me there. From Nancy B. Jefferson, and I gotta say this, while I was at Nancy B. Jefferson, how many of y'all saw the play Hamilton? Has anybody, that's an absolutely magnificent play. I call myself the greatest rapper alive. Some of y'all know that, some of y'all know that. I took my students to go see uh, Hamilton when I was at Douglas, but while I was at Nancy B. Jefferson, I reached out to the producer, her name is Caitlin Pine, of Hamilton. Now, my students at that time are locked up. I reached out to the producer and I said, look, can we bring the Hamilton play to Nancy B. Jefferson? It took two years. I wasn't even at Jefferson anymore. It took two years of us working, and she brought the play. We brought the play to Nancy B. Jefferson. up to you all and while the Q&A is happening cards will be passed out this is where you get to take action if you do not take a couple of steps while you're here this is why like so we've made our case so if we haven't made our case to you you don't want to take action I understand but if we made our case this is the time for you to do something so while we're doing the Q&A we're not gonna do it right now we got to do the demands first but while we're doing the Q&A um, We'll have a QR code. Take your phone out, give us your information. And I'll tell you why we need to get that information with these demands. Our demands go to three separate institutional forces. The first institutional group of forces is the mayor and the school board. And these are the demands for them. Restore Principal Muhammad immediately as principal of Limbloom Math and Science Academy with a four-year contract. 
Restore Gerald Murrow, Kimberly Gibson, and revisit the cases of all six principals who were removed as a result of investigations conducted by Kelly Tarrant and the CPS Law Department until a full and independent investigation of the Law Department and its tactics is completed. Terminate CEO Pedro Martinez for either directing or allowing three offices under his supervision to conduct a witch hunt of Abdul Muhammad and other African American principals. Direct the new CEO to issue a public apology to Mr. Muhammad. The Limbloom community and the each principal and school community affected by witch hunts conducted by the CPS Law Department. And we can't let the OIG off the hook either because now they get involved in this nonsense. Terminate every Limbloom staff member who gave false testimony to the Law Department against Principal Muhammad. Terminate Kelly Tarrant and Libby Massey for using incompetent and unethical one-sided investigative tactics that do not meet the standard for fair investigations or well-reasoned findings. Terminate Devin LaRosa for his role in orchestrating the witch hunt against Abdul Muhammad and for incompetent supervision. Terminate Felicia Sanders and Bogdana Skumbova for, what the, for their role in this. Terminate Kishasha Williams Ford for her role in this and convert the Limbloom Advisory Local School Council into a full LSC. Now, that's what CPS and the mayor control. I don't trust the, may I don't trust the mayor's office or CPS to investigate itself. So we have to have another target, what's called a secondary target, who can make your primary target do what they're supposed to do. This is the secondary target. The United States Department of Justice Office of Civil Rights, the Illinois State Board of Education, and possibly the Illinois Attorney General. Right. We want each one of these to investigate Kelly Tarrant, Devin LaRosa, the Office of Network Supports, the Law Department, the Office of Local School Council Relations, and the Inspector General for Civil Rights Violations and the Violations of Due Process. Establish a commission to review all questionable removals of Chicago principals since 2010. This is our second uh, secondary target. The governor and the state legislature conduct hearings into the civil rights and due process violations committed by Kelly Tarrant, Devin LaRosa, the Office of Network Supports, the Law Department, the Office of Local School Council Relations, and the Inspector General, and propose and pass legislation to prevent such abuses from ever reoccurring. So those are our demands. How this works is we have to Group people, organize people, and aim those people at each one of those institutions. You all, do you, would you like to be a part of that? Yes. All right, do you have those cards? You got those cards in your hands? Please take your phones out. And if you, uh, the card doesn't work, you can go to Justice for Abdul Muhammad. There should be a link there where you can just give us your information. We have to be able to connect with you and keep in touch with you so that when it is time to move on these institutions, you move with us. We move together. Our power is in our ability to turn out. We can't go against, we can't go up against them. We can't make these demands with three people showing up. We need a mass movement. We need you and 26 of your friends. I'm not playing. And we can't get you if we can't stay in contact with you. So the most, one of the most important things you can do right now is complete that card. Kent, do you have the uh, petition link? The petition's on the website. Now this is a different QR code. That one is for your contact information. This one is the petition with all of those demands. We want you to sign that petition. 